Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to AP U.S. History, where we talk today um, about politics and the economy in the late 1800s. Now, the Civil War was a great tragedy for the United States, obviously, but for some Northerners, it was, in a way, a blessing in disguise. For supplying the massive Union Army, in which almost two million men served over the entire course of the war, with a peak size of close to one million. Factories turned out uniforms, guns, uh, packaged food, and of course the steel needed um, to build ever more rails uh, and trains and ships, uh, and new factories, of course, to support the war effort. And this was taking place when many new improvements were being made in manufacturing processes, and also how business was organized was changing. So that the late 1800s have sometimes been called a second industrial revolution. And of course, it was a revolution that made the men who led it wealthy. Although the word millionaire had existed since the early 1700s, it only first came into widespread use following the Civil War, because this was the first time you actually had enough people worth over a million dollars that you needed a common term to describe them. Now, the first industrial revolution of the 1700s and early 1800s had been based on textiles. Um, and even for Northerners who didn't like to admit it, um, also heavily based on slavery to supply the cotton to the textile mills. But if the first industrial revolution was based on textiles, the second industrial revolution was based on steel, and thus too on coal and iron, the main ingredients of producing steel. And this was in large part due to the work of Henry Bessemer, an English engineer who in 1850 developed what we call the Bessemer process, which was a way to make strong, lightweight steel that wasn't brittle. Um, his people knew how to make steel and had known how to make it for a long time, but it tended to be fairly brittle. It was sharper than iron tools, but not as strong. But now it was much stronger and furthermore possible to make it in large batches, um, partly by melting it down um, in large crucibles like this one, um, and then blasting air, highly pressurized air through it to even out the consistency of the metal and also to help um, blast out impurities. And the steel um, would form the frames for the skyscrapers built in the late 1800s, the railroads that would cross the country, suspension bridges like the famous Brooklyn Bridge, the longest bridge on earth when it was completed in 1883. And, of course, railroads allowed the shipment of all the goods um, mass-produced in this second industrial revolution all across the country. Indeed, mass production was at the heart of the Industrial Revolution, whether the first or second Industrial Revolution. As manufacturing was broken down into many steps, you no longer had to hire expert craftsmen. Rather, anyone could be trained relatively easily to make a single part of the process product, or complete one step in the process of putting it together. Indeed, that's most refined, just let one person do one single job all day, which is boring. Some people said it was dehumanizing, and often poorly paid, but it was efficient, leading to the mass production of goods that had once been put together one at a time by hand tools. And this, in turn, meant things became cheaper. More people could buy more products so that, in some ways, even working-class people could feel rich. Working-class and certain middle-class people might now have several suits of clothes. Historically, most people had just two suits of clothes, one for everyday wear and one for special occasions. Um, but now you might have several. And even a working-class or middle-class person might have clothes in at least sort of the same style um, as the wealthy. Maybe not the same quality cloth or stitching, but from a distance, it could look like the same sort of clothes. Um, you might be able to own a clock or even a watch of your own. Although in this industrialized society, when you had to be everywhere on time, having a watch or a clock wasn't so much a luxury as a necessity. And as things were produced um, in mass, it was now possible to buy them in mass. Um, as department stores, Macy's being the first, founded in 1858, um, allowed people to buy things of many different types in a single store. 
uh, and not have to go to specialized stores to buy different products. Or if you didn't live in a big city or even a moderate sized city, which often had smaller department stores um, and would put newspaper advertisements out whenever they got the latest shipment of goods from bigger cities. If you live far away, even in remote areas, um, you could order things through mail order catalogs, Montgomery Ward or Sears and Roebuck. Um, and thanks to railroads um, and the recent development of, um, of mail being delivered to your house rather than having to go uh, to the post office to pick it up, you could order almost anything from anywhere in the country. Um, Montgomery Ward or Sears and Roebuck were basically the Amazon of their day. You could even order a house from Sears. It would be shipped to you in parts and you could assemble it at home. Now, as companies grew larger, they needed people to manage them. And so, a middle class expanded um, of office managers and accountants and what would come to be white collar workers. Um, um, no longer working on the factory floor, but also not owning the factory. Somebody in the middle to manage these growing companies. And in this age of prosperity, they too tried to imitate the wealthy in other ways. Of course, if you were really rich, you had a country estate to escape the pollution and disease of big cities. But if you couldn't afford your own estate in the countryside, um, a member of the middle class might join a club, um, all put money together, um, and build a place in the country of their own, uh, a country club. And even for the working class, many large cities began building public parks so that people could have a little bit of time, at least away from the obvious, um, obvious urban congestion and pollution. And while around here we don't tend to think of parks as being especially large, in some big cities they can cover many acres um, and really be a feel of the wilderness in the city. Um, and furthermore, while the average factory worker was paid much less than expert craftsmen might have been, most, at least in the mid-1800s, could still hope for a wage good enough to get ahead in the world, um, which of course ended up attracting workers to America from all around the world. But the idea developed of the American dream, or a new idea, not of being the independent yeoman farmer that Thomas Jefferson had so admired, but rather um, of working hard, saving money, and perhaps opening your own business, or at least rising to uh, a high-ranking managerial position in someone else's. And one of the most popular writers of the 18, later 1800s um, capitalized on this, a man named Horatio Alger famous for writing what are described as rags to riches stories, in which a poor boy, probably a homeless kid off the street uh, in the big city, maybe someone just coming from the countryside, um, worked hard, um, learned manners, typically found a mentor in an older man, um, and with maybe a little bit of work too, or a little bit of luck, um, worked his way up to being wealthy maybe not owning his own company, um, but being a prominent manager. Um, here we can see a book entitled $500. To make $500 in those days was it's quite a bit of money. Um, at a time when we might think of the minimum wage being about a dollar a day, although there was no legal minimum wage. That was seen as kind of the typical wage of a most working men. Now, there were a couple reasons American factory workers could expect higher wages in the mid-1800s than, say, a European factory worker. For one thing, if you weren't paid the wage you wanted, you had the option of moving west. Um, and to be sure, it was a lot more easily said than done, but the fact that it was possible did force factory work owners to pay a bit better wages. Again, it was the case in the crowded countries of Europe. Furthermore, the U.S. government also promoted um, prosperity in American manufacturing through high tariffs. Although the exact size of the tariffs varied um, in the late 1800s, overall, um, from the end of the Civil War up to the early 20th century, tariffs were fairly high, thanks to Republican 
um, dominance of the government for most of that period. Um, and businessmen in general tended to support um, a high tariff and thus the Republican Party. The Republican Party, too, tended to be supported by Civil War veterans, at least in the North, um, and by African Americans who, when they were able to vote at all, wanted to vote for the party of Lincoln. Democrats tended to oppose tariffs um, because they were seen as hurting the poor, especially farmers and immigrants who had the worst jobs um, because they saw the tariff as just driving up the prices of the things they had to buy. And really, throughout the late 1800s, whether you preferred a high or a low tariff, was one of the few big differences really separating the Republican and the Democratic parties in terms of policy. Otherwise, the government had a pretty laissez-faire approach to the economy. Laissez-faire, I'm sorry to say, being a French term, sorry to do that to you, um, meaning more or less to leave it alone. The government, for the most part, stood back and let businesses compete with each other. The idea being, the strongest and most efficient would succeed through the laws of supply and demand. To get someone to buy your product, you either have to make the best product or the cheapest product. And, for much of the 1800s, this did lead um, to companies keeping prices from getting too high. Also, and if you were if you were successful, there was nothing to hold you back. Unlike many other countries in the world, a wealthy person wouldn't be forced um, to turn over his profits or his entire company to the government um, or make a loan um, to the king on the king's terms. In the U.S., what you had was yours to keep. And so this encouraged risk-taking and innovation, too. Indeed, the entrepreneurs who started their own businesses and succeeded were seen as heroes um, to most Americans. And so were the inventors who made these factories more efficient. Of course, the most famous inventor of the late 18, early 1900s is Thomas Edison, best known for developing not the first light bulb, but the first profitable light bulb, as well as about 1,100 other patented items, um, or at least patents on various items. Um, he developed types of record players, movie cameras, power plants, by electrifying people's homes. Um, he encouraged them to buy the electric appliances he produced. He even developed the electric chair um, as a stunt um, to show that a type of electricity used by his rivals was dangerous, dangerous enough to kill you in an electric chair. Mind you, Edison's form was even more dangerous, but he didn't point that out to them. Um, although, while Edison held all these patents, in reality, he did not invent all 1,100 of the things he had a patent on. Um, rather, his greatest or most important development was the development of what we might call a research park or a research and development center. Uh, at Menlo Park, New Jersey, he hired many other people to help develop the things that he then got the patent and the credit and the profit for. And while many people resented this, um, most famously his most brilliant employee, Nikola Tesla, um, who later went to work for one of his rivals. The fact is, um, this applied essentially the principles of mass production to invention. And today, most of the inventions we enjoy are not developed by some lone genius in his garage or basement or mad scientist tower, but by a whole group of engineers working on it for a big company. Um, now, one of Edison's rivals for whom Tesla eventually worked was George Westinghouse. His original invention was the air brake for trains. Now, this may not sound real dramatic, but at a time when railroads were crossing the country, anything that made railroads more efficient was very important. And prior to the invention of the air brake, if you wanted to stop a train, two guys working for the railroad had to climb up on top of the train, one on the front and one on the back, men called brake men. And they would run along top of the train, jumping from car to car, on each car turning a wheel to set the brakes on that train car individually. This, of course, was dangerous for the brakemen. It was also kind of a slow process, so that stopping a train was hard. And even today, slowing down or stopping a train is not an easy thing to do. They're huge and heavy. But at that point, it was so inefficient 
trains just couldn't go that fast because they needed to be able to slow down. You had to start putting the brakes on about a mile before where you wanted to stop. With the air brake, though, um, all the cars were connected by an air hose running from the engine down through all the cars. Um, when the engineer pulled a lever in the engine, that sent a blast of air down that hose, setting all the brakes almost simultaneously. Um, again, safer for the railroad employees and safer for everybody working with trains. And this made him a lot of money, which he invested in other things, uh, including his own electric company, which was a rival to Edison. Um, indeed, Westinghouse's method of delivering electric current, alternating current, ended up um, beating Edison in what were called the current wars. And there are other inventions. As we've already mentioned, after 1837, Samuel Morse's telegraph. Let businessmen, indeed, almost anybody, communicate with one another between cities. You could now send a message across the country in a matter of hours. In 1876, communication became even simpler with Alexander Graham Bell's invention of the telephone. Again, 1876, it was even easier to communicate between cities. In 1896, Guglielmo Marconi developed a wireless telegraph, which would kind of be the basis for the later invention of radio. And of course, was even another way to make communication simpler. This was particularly important for ships out at sea, wanting to communicate with people on land. And so all these inventions made a communication revolution possible, letting businesses and governments manage operations over much larger areas. In the past, most businesses were pretty much limited to one city and maybe the area around it because transportation and communication were so slow. And now managing a company that spanned the entire country, even an entire continent, um, was possible um, and practical to do so. Um, and as companies grew larger and employed more managers, they needed somewhere to put them. And so, um, as offices grew larger and larger, skyscrapers developed too. Um, made possible by a couple of things. Um, one um, was the development of steel frame construction. Um, in the past, of course, most buildings had been built of wood or of brick. But a wooden building can only become too, so high before it gets rickety. A brick building also has a practical limit. This brick, of course, is fairly heavy. You can pick up one brick, but picking up 100 bricks is a job. Bricks are heavy enough that as you stack them higher and higher in a building, the weight of the upper floors will begin to crush the bricks in the lower floors. So you have to make the lower walls wider and wider to support the weight of the higher walls. Um, and eventually you just reach a practical limit to this, which in theory is probably about six to eight stories, but even something that tall. Um, was fairly rare. Steel, though, while also heavy, um, is much lighter for its strength than brick and easier to work with than brick or stone or wood. Um, and so in the 1870s, they began building large buildings around a frame of steel, particularly in Chicago, where they had to rebuild the entire city after the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. Of course, there's another downside to a tall building as well. Um, today, if you live in a, in a tall building, a tall apartment building, where is probably the most prestigious or desirable apartment? The top floor. The very top, the penthouse apartment. But that's a fairly new development. For most of history, where the richest person probably live? At the bottom, because walking upstairs is for poor people. But in the 1860s, Elisha Otis developed a safety elevator. And the idea of an elevator is not a new idea. A box on a cable you can lift up with a pulley is pretty straightforward. But Otis developed um, one with catches in the elevator shaft. So if the cable broke, the car of the elevator would just fall a short distance um, and the passengers would survive. He would even go around and demonstrate this at country fairs by building an open elevator shaft going up in the elevator car, and his brother would stand by with an axe and cut the cable. Um, and he'd fall just a short way. 
And of course, Otis Elevators is still one of the world's main producers of elevators. Next time you're in an elevator, look at the label. There's a fair chance it's an Otis Elevator. And again, these were particularly used in Chicago um, after the Great Fire of 1871. Um, all of course, skyscrapers eventually spread all around the world. But Chicago would have most of the world's skyscrapers um, until the early 20th century, when New York would finally surpass them. Chicago also became a center of the meatpacking industry. Being in the Midwest, of course, there were lots of farms raising livestock, and cattle and hogs were shipped to Chicago from, say, Iowa, Illinois, Ohio, eventually from the Great Plains. And during the Civil War, when the massive Union Army had to be fed, um, meatpacking plants industrialized. Philip Armour was one of the meatpackers to make Chicago into a center of the meatpacking industry essentially turning mass production to the idea of slaughtering and butchering livestock. He claimed to use every part of the pig but the squeal. Of course, the meat you want to eat, the intestines you can use for sausage casings, the, uh, the short hairs, the bristles of the hog you can use for hair brushes and toothbrushes. You can blow up the bladder and make a little ball out of it. Um, the hooves, uh, well, um, you can take the meat out of them to eat. The hooves and bones can be boiled down to make for the the bones can be ground up to make fertilizer, the hooves boiled down to make glue. Uh, I'm using every part of the pig but the squeal. His rival meat packer was Gustavus Swift, um, who developed the first refrigerated railroad car, so that all the meat that they slaughtered in Chicago could be shipped to almost any part of the country. Most importantly, the biggest market of all, um, New York City. Prior to the refrigerated railroad car, you might ship a steak to New York City, but it probably wasn't that good to eat once it got there. But um, the development of the refrigerated railroad car and refrigeration in general is probably one of the biggest modern inventions we don't think much about or appreciate because it's so straightforward. You can go and open your refrigerator and there's cold food in it. But um, this means you don't have to live close to where your food comes from. Um, Arizona is one of the fastest growing states in the country. Um, you can't grow anything in Arizona, but it doesn't matter because you can ship everything in. Um, they recently had uh, I'm a blueberry or a strawberry. Is it good? Yeah. Where'd it come from? I don't know. I, I don't know. You don't have to know. It, it probably got shipped here from Honduras or something. But that's okay because we have refrigeration to make that possible. Yes, sir. How would like the railroad car work? Like, would it, would it just be kind of like, like kind of like or would it be blocks of ice, basically? Yeah, there were blocks of ice and certain chemicals to kind of help it melt slowly, and there were ducts to help it to circulate through the car. We have big blocks of ice in the end, uh, in each end. And I'll be honest, I'm not sure how this was done, but even by the late 1800s, there were factories that made ice. I'm not sure how in those days they made ice artificially, but they did. Um, also, during the winter, they would cut big blocks of ice and store them in sawdust and straw and big insulated buildings. But lots of people did this on a small scale, having a little insulated cabinet. And they'd buy a big block of ice every couple of days and put that in the top of their ice box and would keep everything in the pool. Um, before we had electric refrigerators. Um, rail travel was also, by the late 1800s, becoming more comfortable. Um, <coughs> Early railroads had been pretty uncomfortable. You sat in a wooden bench, you took a long trip, and you wanted to take a nap overnight, you had to prop yourself up against the window of the person next to you. But and this was changing in the mid-1800s as George Pullman um, developed the first sleeper car. During the day, um, you'd have seats um, to sit in. At night, a Pullman porter would come along um, and fold down um, the compartments over the seats, fold down the seats themselves to make bunk beds. Um, get a sleeper car so that as railroads cross the continent, you could comfortably travel by rail. Um, Pullman made other railroad cars too, but the Pullman Palace Car Company was very important to America's economy and comfort. Um, and would later be at the center of one of the biggest strikes of the late 1800s. Pullman also made a point of employing former slaves where he could, both to help them out and also because they were used to doing what they were told and would be polite to customers. Um, and the habit 
I'm going to call them all George after their employer, George Coleman, um, which many didn't appreciate, but they liked having the job too much to complain. Railroads changed other things too. In fact, railroads changed time itself. Now, strictly speaking, when is noon? Well, but how do you know it's 12? It's the sun's up in the middle of the sky. When the sun is directly overhead. Is the sun directly overhead everywhere at the same time? No. No. Um, now, in, say, 1800, if you were to travel from Johnson City to Jonesboro, it doesn't matter that Jonesboro is about two minutes slower than Johnson City, because it's going to take so long to get there, what's two minutes? If you travel to Knoxville, that's going to take you a couple days. The fact that they're about 30 minutes slower is not that important. But when trains can cross the country um, so quickly, and their schedules matter so much that they had to standardize time. It was the railroads who developed the first time zones. And this is a fairly modern map of time zones. The early ones developed in the late 1800s were slightly different. Um, but the basic idea was the same. Indeed, as railroads traveled so far and so fast, it was said that they annihilated time itself. <coughs> now, this period of great technological advances and growing wealth for the industrialists and the businessmen um, who ran it, and even the conspicuous consumption of the middle class managers who worked for them, wasn't perfect. The country was getting richer, but it certainly had its problems. The great writer Mark Twain um, described the late 1800s, in fact, even the early 1870s, um, as a gilded age. Something that's gilded, as you hopefully know, um, looks like gold because it's coated in gold. But it's coated in gold typically to make something far cheaper look valuable. So this gilded age, as Twain would call it and others would, would later adopt the term, was beautiful and shining on the surface, but shoddy underneath. Um, and while goods were becoming cheaper, the lure of American jobs and American land drew so many immigrants from other countries that land and jobs became scarcer, driving down wages, or at least causing wages to stagnate for working men. Likewise, mechanization, to some extent, reduced the need for workers, as machines could do what men had done before. Furthermore, <clears throat> as coal and, by the late 1800s, oil were burnt in greater and greater quantities, Industrial pollution, which had existed for a long time just from burning wood, but now became a much larger problem, a scale previously unknown. You know, London was, was famous for the London fogs. Those weren't fog at all. Um, it was smog so thick people could go outside and die from breathing in the air if their lungs were weak. And uh, although there were some early anti-pollution laws passed even in the late 1800s, um, some, a growing number of cities, for example, regulated what kind of coal you could heat your house with, anthracite coal being a cleaner burning coal than, say, bituminous coal. In some places, you had to burn anthracite coal um, to heat your home in the city, it being um, less polluting. And politically, there were troubles, too. Andrew Johnson's unpopularity and impeachment had weakened the office of the president, and the presidents who followed him didn't do much to regain that power. <coughs> of course, Ulysses S. Grant was elected because he was a war hero. Indeed, every president elected for the rest of the 1800s, indeed up through 1900 itself, would be a Civil War veteran, with one exception, that being Grover Cleveland. Indeed, reminding candidates, or reminding voters that the candidate was a veteran was called waving the bloody shirt. After one campaign rally where a veteran actually brought out a blood-stained shirt from the Civil War to wave it around. Um, and one of the big things that would define the third two-party system developing during and especially after the Civil War um, would be voting as you shot but your voting loyalties would often be based on what you had done during the Civil War, voting, you know, shooting against those traitorous rebel Democrats or those tyrannical Republicans. Um, 
This too was characterized for the most part by relatively weak presidents. Um, not strong, not um, men with a lot of power, say Andrew Jackson or Abraham Lincoln had had. Uh, <coughs> in fact, uh, the only president from this time period to appear on U.S. currency is Ulysses S. Grant. Anybody know what bill he appears on? The 50. And what's on the back? Oh. You can pull it out and look. U.S. Capitol buildings, showing that symbolically it was Congress that had more power than the president in the late 1800s, and during this third two-party system. Again, when, when the main policy differences were over the tariffs, Republicans wanting them high, Democrats wanting them lower, although even by historical standards, they weren't seeking incredibly low tariffs. And Congress was often dominated by wealthy businessmen, either wealthy men running for Congress or more often members of Congress, especially the Senate, growing wealthy through bribes um, from influential businessmen. The Senate was known at one point as the Millionaires Club, at a time when a million dollars was a lot of money. And as president, while Ulysses S. Grant was himself an honest man, he was very trusting and protective of his close associates. He was used to being you know, a military officer, a general whose aides wanted to see him advance because as he was promoted, they would be promoted too. And he was used to trusting the men who worked for him, and the army that often works. Uh, in politics, not always. And while again Grant himself was personally honest, many members of the government he led were uh, infamous for being involved in the many scandals of the Gilded Age. <coughs> and probably the biggest and most famous scandal to taint Grant's administration really took place almost entirely before he became president, but it was discovered while he was president, and so, uh, in a way, he got the blame, mostly unfairly. <coughs> and this is the Credit Mobilier scandal, sometimes also called Credit Mobilier. This was an American company, but named after a French bank, and so you can pronounce it the American way or the French way. Um, and some people call it Credit Mobilier, getting a little bit of both. Um, to sound extra smart, I guess. Um, Credit Mobilier was a company created during the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. Credit Mobilier got contracts from the Union Pacific Railroad, which was one of the two companies building the Transcontinental Railroad. Two companies, one starting in the east, that being the Union Pacific, and one out west, the Central Pacific, built towards the center of the continent. Of course, the more track each could lay, the more money they made. So Union Pacific was building the eastern part of the Transcontinental Railroad, except they had much of the work done by Credit Mobilier, uh, who grossly overcharged the Union Pacific Railroad, um, who in turn had their costs covered by loans from Congress, eventually paid back, but for now really driving up the stock of Credit Mobilier at apparently the expense of Union Pacific, except the same men who owned Union Pacific had founded Credit Mobilier, um, thus profiting off, uh, off cheating Congress through these loans. Congress didn't look into this too closely, though, because many congressmen were given Credit Mobilier stock or sold it very, very cheaply. <coughs> yeah, and almost all of this took place before Grant became president, it was only discovered in 1872, and so hurt his reputation. And that of many politicians, although none was ever effectively prosecuted. <coughs> now, at this point, um, when the income tax had been created during the Civil War um, was eliminated, one of the few ways the U.S. government raised money, um, as had been the case throughout most of its history, was through a tax on whiskey the other main sources of income being land sales um, and the tariff. But it, it turned out in 1875, when it was discovered, that U.S. government officials had stolen millions of dollars in whiskey tax money, um, a conspiracy known as the Whiskey Ring, a ring in those days simply meaning an illegal conspiracy. <coughs> 
Um, when this was discovered, Grant promised he would let no guilty man escape until it turned out that his private secretary was one of the guilty men, and the investigations were dropped. It was discovered um, then late in Grant's presidency that his secretary of war, William Belknap, um, who as secretary of war oversaw the Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, had skimmed off $24,000, back when that was a fair amount of money, um, from the government accounts. Um, he'd also sold the right to supply goods to the Indians um, to various businessmen. Um, and the way those businessmen made back the bribes they paid the belt map was they sold low qual or provided low quality supplies to the Indians, blankets with holes in them, rotting meat, and things like that. Because in the treaties where Indians accepted moving on to reservations, the U.S. government always promised to provide them with certain things um, to support them. But under Belknap's leadership in particular, although certainly other leaders of the Bureau of Indian Affairs too, Indians often didn't get all they were promised. Um, now you may notice on the seal there, the Bureau of Indian Affairs is today part of the Department of the Interior, but originally it was part of the Department of War. I suppose this shows that once we saw Indians as our enemy, and now view them as a natural resource. Now, in 1876, Ulysses S. Grant had served two terms. And if two terms was good enough for George Washington, it was good enough um, for Ulysses S. Grant. And so the Republicans nominated a Civil War veteran from Ohio, the Republican governor of Ohio, Rutherford D. Hayes. Um, with a vice president from New York, William Wheeler, a politician so obscure, Hayes said he had never heard of him before he was told he became his vice president. But Ohio and New York were major swing states. The Democrats, in turn, had a presidential candidate, Samuel Tilden, from New York, with a reputation as a reforming governor of that state. And it was a pretty close election in 1876 between Tilden and Hayes. Um, and in Hayes' service in the Civil War, where he was wounded multiple times, leading men very bravely in battle, was brought up frequently by the Republicans. Tilden was not a Civil War veteran. It turns out, though, he was a bit more popular, winning a slight majority of the popular vote. But of course, the popular vote is not always what matters, it's the electoral vote that determines the election. And here, things were more complicated. <coughs> because several states um, ended up having irregularities in their electoral um, counting. Um, most of them in the South, South Carolina, Louisiana, and of course Florida, where the U.S. military still occupied these states as part of Reconstruction, and where local Democrats, of course, supported Tilden, local Republicans supported Hayes. It was not clear who won the votes in these three states, there was also one elector out in Oregon um, who was technically a U.S. post office employee when he was chosen as elector. An elector can't be a government employee, although he planned to quit his job before the electors actually cast their votes. So there were 20 electoral votes in dispute. With those 20 votes not counted, neither man had a majority of the electoral college. Hayes would have needed all 20 to win, Tilden just one. And of course, this was a huge matter of political controversy. Uh, <coughs> and finally, Congress decided, because the Constitution doesn't quite say what to do here. Um, it says what to do if no one gets a majority of the votes. It doesn't say what to do if you don't know who got the votes, um, period. Um, it was decided that a special committee or a special commission would decide who would get the disputed votes. Initially, there were five members of the Supreme Court, five representatives, and five senators on this committee, seven of them known to be Republicans, seven of them Democrats. One of the Supreme Court justices, David Davis, was believed to have no preference, so he would really have decided all those 20 votes. At the last minute, though, he was appointed to the Senate and resigned from the Supreme Court and the committee. He was replaced by a Republican, with eight Republicans and seven Democrats on the committee. Surprise, surprise, all 20 votes went to Hayes. Democrats were furious. And to be fair, 
probably he should have gotten those 19 Southern votes and Hayes the one vote from Oregon, although I guess there's no way to be certain. But the Democrats were furious. Some called for a new civil war, said Tilden or blood. Although some Democrats were afraid to complain too loudly, fearing that Grant might just set himself up as a military dictator if there was no proper outcome to the election. Some black people in the South were afraid if the Democrat killed in one, slavery might be reestablished. A very tense situation. And then suddenly, all the complaining stopped. As apparently some deal was worked out behind the scenes, now known as the Compromise of 1877. As it came in the very early months um, of 1877, not long before the March 4th inauguration date. And the Democrats um, agreed that Hayes could be president. But immediately afterwards, President Grant and then President Hayes began pulling the last northern troops out of the South, bringing Reconstruction to an end. Um, and in Hayes, although he had little of anything to do with this compromise, we think. In fact, early on, he even told people he'd lost the election um, before coming around. And Hayes was tainted by this, although himself personally an honest man, whose main form of entertainment was getting together with his wife and vice president and singing hymns around the piano. Um, he was known for the rest of his one term as Brother Fraud B. Hayes. Um, <coughs> and again, politics was infamous for its corruption at this point. The Republican Party came to be split between those who benefited um, from the spoil system, a group known as the stalwarts, and he, and he supported the spoil system, the patronage and machine politics in which people were rewarded for supporting winners politically with government jobs or other favors. And the leader of the stalwarts pictured there uh, was Roscoe Conkling, a senator from New York. But there were also Republicans who wanted to reform politics, you know, looking back to you know, their history of opposing wickedness in slavery, the moral reforming element of the Republican Party. And these men were known as half-breeds, and James G. Blaine being seen as their leader, although certainly having plenty of skeletons in his own closet. <coughs> Again, the big argument being over the spoil system. If it was appropriate, for political machines to hand out rewards to men uh, and but possibly women who supported the winning party. Get a major government job for an important supporter in the cabinet or some other big post. Minor government jobs like postmaster. Um, you know, for smaller supporters, they kept track of which neighborhoods voted which way when voting was public. If you weren't important enough to even be made postmaster, but everybody in your neighborhood voted for the winner, you might get a public park, you might get running water in your part of town, you might get a local school or a fire station, or something else as a reward. If you voted for the loser, you might not. They might stop trash collection locally, too. Of the many political machines, the most famous was Tammany Hall, the Democratic machine that dominated New York City and thus often dominated New York politics as a whole from the mid-1800s until well into the 20th century. The most famous boss of Tammany Hall was William Tweed, but uh, most major cities had a political boss and a political machine, or rather two, a Republican and a Democratic machine, uh, and controlling a major city and could help you control an entire state. <laughs> For a long time, Tennessee politics was dominated by Boss Crump of Memphis. He controlled the vote in Memphis. He even made sure black people could vote at a time that voting was rare for black people, as long as they voted Democratic. And as long as Middle Tennessee would play along with Boss Crump, he could run all of Tennessee. Eventually, Middle Tennessee turned against him, and his power ended, but only after about 50 years of dominating state politics. Well, <coughs> When Hayes' one term was up, um, the stalwarts in the Republican Party in 1880 were trying to find a candidate who would be popular enough to win, and many proposed bringing back Ulysses S. Grant for a third term, the Constitution not prohibiting that. Sure, two terms have been good enough for George Washington, 
But Grant took a break between his, his two terms. Maybe he could come back. And again, while he wasn't personally corrupt, corruption could obviously take place while he was president. The stalwarts favored him. The half-breeds in favor of their leader, James G. Blaine, but he had too many enemies uh, within his own party. And finally, they decided to nominate um, James Garfield, a Civil War veteran from Ohio, uh, and a known half-breed. And of course, his vice president would be from New York, Chester Arthur, um, famous as a machine politician, well known for his role in the corrupt spoils system. Um, <coughs> and of course, a Civil War veteran from Ohio and a vice president from New York, the Republicans won. And after winning, Roscoe Conkling approached President Garfield and demanded that one of his friends be made Secretary of the Treasury, demanded that another be made Collector of the Port of New York, be in charge of collecting all the tariffs paid by ships stopping in New York Harbor. That, that job, in turn, employed lots of other people in well-paid jobs. So controlling the Customs House gave you lots of jobs to give to your supporters, and lots of money flowed through the Customs House. There was plenty to steal if you felt like it. Conklin's view is that because the Customs House of New York was in New York, the senior senator from New York should get to pick the head of the Customs House. But Garfield refused um, to give Conklin the jobs he wanted, and so Conklin very ostentatiously on the floor of the Senate, resigned. As did the junior senator from New York, Thomas Platt, um, who people then made fun of as Me Too Platt. Conkling and Platt assumed that New York would send them right back to the Senate, and that would be a big slap in the face to Garfield. To their surprise, um, they were not returned to the Senate. Um, Conkling would, would return to his profitable law practice and also an affair with the daughter of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Um, at one point, her husband tried to shoot him with a shotgun, but I guess wasn't a good shot. Um, he later died after walking home in a blizzard. Platt stayed important in New York politics and many years later would put an annoying reformer from New York um, in the vice presidential position, saying vice presidents never amount to anything. We'll never hear of Theodore Roosevelt again. So, Garfield had uh, really put down that the corrupt stalwarts. And Garfield was a brilliant man, a former college professor, fluent in many languages. His party trick, and everyone needs a party trick, was he would write in an open notebook with both hands at once, with his right hand writing in Latin, his left hand writing the same thing in Greek. Um, he had accepted some credit mobile stock, but had returned it, and mostly escaped the scandal. Republican reformers had high hopes for James Garfield, and then he was shot. Now, Charles Gateau, his assassin, is honestly kind of a loser. Um, he had failed at business many times. He was estranged from his wife, who was understandably unhappy that he lost what little money they ever made, and they had to leave their apartment every month ahead of the rent collector and move on. Um, he had tried to campaign on behalf of Garfield. He'd given a, a speech on street corners here and there and believed he should be rewarded with a diplomatic job in France. He wanted to be consul in Marseille. Um, and in those days, um, if you wanted to see the president, you went to the White House and asked to see the president. And usually he'd see you after you waited your turn. Eventually, Garfield said, don't let him in anymore. He's weird and annoying. Um, he tried to see the Secretary of State, but James G. Blaine wouldn't have anything to do with him either. So he felt he wasn't getting the rewards he ought to under the spoil system. And so he bought a gun, regretting he wasn't able to borrow enough money to buy a more expensive gun that would look nicer in a museum. Um, he began stalking Garfield. He had a chance to shoot him as he got into his carriage outside the White House, but he was with his wife and decided it would be bad manners to shoot a man in front of his wife. Apparently, though, it's okay to shoot the president in a train station walking with the Secretary of State. Guiteau came upon Garfield from behind, shot him twice in the back in a railway station, and announced, I am a stalwart of stalwarts, and Arthur is president now. Very embarrassing for Chet Arthur, who basically hid in Roscoe Conklin's apartment for the next couple of months. Because Garfield took a couple of months to die. Um, 
They invented air conditioning to try to make him more comfortable. Alexander Graham Bell developed a metal detector to try to find the bullet. Um, they built a special railroad line to give him a smooth ride to the Jersey Shore, which in those days was a classy vacation destination. Um, but Garfield actually had shockingly bad medical care, even by the standards of the day. Indeed, after he died, Guiteau in his trial said, I didn't kill Garfield, I only shot him. It was his doctors who killed him. And there is some truth to that, although had Garfield, Guiteau not shot him in the back, he wouldn't have had to deal with Dr. Bliss. Um, Guiteau also um, rejected the plea that he was insane. He said, I'm perfectly sane. I did this because God told me to do it. The judge was unimpressed, and Guiteau was executed um, a few months later, walking to the noose, singing a song he had written himself about going to the Lord. So Chet Arthur's president now, and it was assumed he would be as corrupt as any machine politician could hope. But he, uh, he surprised everyone by becoming, for the first time in his life, a model of political honesty. And there's some debate why he did this. Some think he wanted to prove he wasn't part of any plot with Guiteau, as some people feared. Some thought, perhaps too, look later on, that he wanted to leave a good legacy, because Arthur knew he was dying. Um, he had a kidney ailment, probably Bright's disease, and his doctor told him if he would just quit the, the, um, the high-living party life that he enjoyed, he might live for years. If he kept eating rich foods and drinking a lot, he didn't have many years left. And Arthur said, eh, uh, and continued the life he enjoyed, um, even if only for a couple more years. And so, to everyone's surprise, he supported cleaning up the government, signing the Pendleton Civil Service Act in 1883, um, which required most government jobs to be filled based on ability. Among other things, they created the first civil service exams, a test you had to take when applying for a government job to see if you actually were qualified for that job. It also made it illegal to fire or demote government workers for political reasons. Now, there are plenty of loopholes in this. It did not cover all government jobs. But this would be the first step to making government less and less available as a political reward. Of course, Arthur did not get to run for his own term as president. In 1884, at last, James G. Blaine, the plumed knight from the state of Maine, got to run for the presidency. But, <coughs> then, um, we've mentioned already, revelations of corruption came back to haunt him. Here being a famous political cartoon showing him hiding his face, but covered with tattoos naming all his scandals. Um, particularly his investments in railroads were often seen as dishonest. Um, someone turned up a letter he had written um, with some pretty incriminating stuff in it and signed, burn this letter. The guy is saying you did not burn the letter. If you're telling someone to burn the business documents you're writing, that's often a bad sign. And furthermore, a fellow Republican went too far in his negative campaigning. And negative campaigning then as now you know, was something people did, but there were limits. And in 1884, another Republican candidate described the Democrats as the party of rum, Romanism, and rebellion. So, if you vote for the Democrats, you're voting for a bunch of drunk Catholic traitors. And to be fair, um, the Democrats often opposed temperance, which Republicans often supported. Many Democrats were Catholics, and some people held that against them. All the Republican candidate, James Blaine, had a Catholic mother. Um, Democrats had fought for the South in the Civil War, and here we see a Southern uh, soldier from an all-Irish unit. Um, so presumably Catholic and drunk as well. But this was going much too far, even by the standards of the day, and this caused enough offense um, to hurt Blaine. Indeed, there was a faction of the Republicans unhappy with Blaine's corruption, a group known as the Mugwumps, who refused to support Blaine splitting the Republican Party, so that a number of Republicans who wanted political reform either did not vote at all or supported the Democratic candidate, Grover Cleveland, um, who was currently governor of New York. He'd previously been mayor of Buffalo. 
and he was known as a reformer for his personal honesty. He'd known as Grover the Good. Until his own scandal appeared, it turned turning out he had an illegitimate child some years ago um, with a woman named Maria Halpin. She claimed that Cleveland had stalked her, um, harassed her into a date, and essentially committed date rape that evening in leaving an illegitimate child afterwards. Cleveland claimed, no, she slept with lots of guys. Of all the men who might have been the father, he was the only one who wasn't married, so he took the blame to save the other guy. Mm. Grover Cleveland and also Blaine had something else against them. This was the only election in between the end of the Civil War and 1900 when neither candidate had served in the Civil War. And Blaine had been a bit too old during the Civil War, and Cleveland had hired a substitute to fight in his place. Um, but in the election of 1884, despite the scandal um, surrounding uh, Maria Halpin and her son, Cleveland was elected. He was pretty close. The popular vote was not 48.9 to 48.3. The Electoral College a bit more clear, 219 to 182. And as president, Cleveland would support a gold standard. In 1873, the United States had officially gone to a gold standard. All dollars had to either be made of or backed by gold. Um, it was believed this maintained a more stable currency. Uh, it was better for the economy. But by the 1880s, this was leading to deflation. With all the new advances in manufacturing, uh, the economy was growing, but the money supply wasn't. There was a pretty limited supply of gold, and, and people had not found a whole lot of new gold in a couple of decades. And so the value of money was increasing. Um, which is good if you have money, but it's hard if you owe money. So hard for farmers and other people um, who are often in debt. And so some people wanted to, again, mint silver dollars. Um, this would lead to inflation, help people pay off their debts. This was also a popular policy among silver miners out west because then they could, again, sell all the silver they could dig up to the U.S. government. Um, Made in 1878, the Bland-Allison Act had required the U.S. government to pur again purchase and mint a limited amount of silver. Um, but um, again, it was pretty limited, it didn't do a lot to deal with inflation or to help out silver miners. When um, Congressman Richard Bland tried to expand this in the 1880s to once again allow unlimited coinage of silver, Cleveland blocked that, angering many Westerners, in particular many farmers in general, despite farmers often being big supporters of the Democratic Party. And so that would hurt Cleveland in 1888 when the Republicans nominated Benjamin Harrison to run for the presidency. He was the grandson of President William Henry Harrison. He was a senator from Indiana, a veteran of the Civil War, who had helped Sherman burn Georgia. He campaigned in support of a protective tariff, but he lost the popular vote in the election of 1888 uh, by about 90,000 votes, but he had enough support in the populous states of the North to carry the Electoral College 233 to 168. Uh, Cleveland didn't even carry his home state of New York this time. But <coughs> four years later, um, in the election of 1892, Cleveland would try for a second term after all. Um, and in this case, he would win. Um, largely because, as we'll look at in more detail later on, many Westerners who did tend to vote Republican because Republicans had supported the Transcontinental Railroad and the Homestead Act, were so angry about the Republicans wanting a high tariff and a gold standard that many Westerners voted for a third party, the Populist Party, um, which took votes from both Republicans and Democrats, but more from the Republicans than the Democrats. So in 1892, Cleveland returned to the presidency, becoming the only president to serve two non-consecutive terms. Um, although in his second term, like his first, he would be a fairly conservative Democrat. Um, a number of issues would alienate some members of his party. 